recording in progress. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome once again to happy hours of coaching session. And, and uh, today's topic is in continuation of uh, the topic what we had last week. Uh, so last week, in case uh, you attended my session, the topic was on design thinking, right? Uh, I had just uh, introduced you to the concept of what design thinking is, uh, what are the key benefits of design thinking. And today's topic is an extension of the topic on design thinking. Okay, so we'll be talking about one uh, one of the uh, phases of design thinking uh, and how those uh, phases operate, right? Uh, that is what uh, we'll be talking about, right? Remember last week I had told you that design uh, um, thinking is a uh, iterative non-linear process. And although it's a non-linear process, we are starting with the first phase. We're trying to understand uh, what exactly is the first phase uh, and which is where the topic uh, title is also in line with that. Uh, but before that, uh, just a quick um, introduction about myself. Uh, who am I? What do I do? Uh, Ashutosh Bhattodekar here, working as an enterprise agile coach, a design thinker and a trainer and a consultant. Um, I conduct uh, these uh, sessions. So I, I rather, I would say I try to conduct these sessions on a Friday. And the objective is to share knowledge um, within the community, right? Uh, if you're interested, do connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I also have my own uh, YouTube channel where we have 100 plus videos on coaching, Scrum Master, Product Owner, Design Thinking. And in case um, any of you are not subscribed, um, uh, please feel free to subscribe to this channel. It is free subscription. And I'm sure uh, those videos will help you into your journey. Right. Those of you who are on LinkedIn Live or on Twitter or on Yahoo, don't worry. Um, or sorry, YouTube. Uh, the link will be shared with you. Uh, the link of the YouTube channel, etc., will be uh, shared with you um, at the end of this uh, session. So, on that note, um, let me let me start with this uh, topic on who is our user, who's our customer, right? I think, um, and from my experience as a coach, from my experience as a consultant. I've always observed that there's always this confusion. Ultimately, who's the consumer of our product or who's going to pay for our product, right? These discussions are always confusing. And uh, I thought that I will first uh, try to uh, understand. Let us all of us understand who's a user, uh, who's a consumer or who's a customer, right? Um, and let us uh, let us uh, try to understand the critical difference between the, the two. Yeah, as I said, um, I'm available on LinkedIn. I'm available on, uh, I run a community called Pune Jail Thought Leaders. Uh, so where we help uh, network with the uh, fellow professionals. So, so that's a Telegram group. And then um, YouTube channel I've already shared and you can connect with me on LinkedIn. In any case, all this information will be shared with you uh, at the end of the session. So once uh, the session ends, uh, we will be mailing you with um, all this information at the end of the session. Okay. A quick recap of what we did last week. And if you want to have a look at it, there's a video already available on our YouTube channel. Uh, it was around a 30, 35 minute session what we had, uh, where I explained the entire design thinking process from start to end. Empathize, define, ideate prototype, test, and implement a six-stage non-linear uh, divergent thinking and convergent thinking approach. So you diverge and try to open up your sphere as wide as possible, and then you try to converge towards a solution. So that's the a big picture of uh, design thinking, or that's the big uh, problem statement from a, a design thinking perspective, what we have. And as I said, if you're interested, do watch that video on design thinking uh, where I covered all these phases. Now, one of the most important uh, phase in design thinking is empathize. Empathize with whom? Empathize with our users, empathize with our uh, customers. Um, understand what are the pain points the customers are facing? What are their real needs? What exactly is good for them right now? What exactly is not good for them? So that comes in as a part of our empathize approach and which is what uh, the empathize bubble is going to be blown up today and um, i'm going to speak for around 25 to 30 minutes of the empathize bubble and i'm going to talk about what are the various uh, design thinking uh, techniques especially from from an empathize perspective uh, what do we know about our customers what do we do not know about our customers and one very important thing is the customer profiling has changed a lot especially in the world of digitization right earlier 20 25 years back, it was very easy to locate and identify uh, the customer profile. But now uh, it has changed a lot. And we will talk about it um, as we move along this um, course of this discussion. All right. So let us let us move ahead. 
And uh, let us uh, try to understand what do we mean by empathizing or what exactly is the word empathizing meaning uh, from the point of view of a customer perspective. Okay, so, so we will try to understand, uh, uh, first of all, who is a customer, uh, who is a user, what is the difference, are these same people, are these different people, we will try to understand that. And then we will try to understand some of the techniques. Then we'll try to understand some of the key techniques which are used to identify our end users and customers. So what is the difference between a user and a customer? And these terms are used very, uh, uh, I, mean the, I mean, interchangeably we use these two terms, right? I mean, they appear to be synonyms. They appear to be uh, the same terms, user and the customer. But there's a difference. There's a difference between a user and a customer. Summer and uh, let me let me give a very simple example to distinguish. Okay, so let us say um, uh, you have a kid, uh, a toddler, uh, maybe one year old kid, um, and obviously um, he or she will have a mother, right? Um, and obviously baby has to be also feeded at regular intervals, right? So the baby food which you get in the market, who decides to buy that baby food? Is it the kid or is it the mother? Whether it is Farex, whether it is Nestle, who decides to buy it? Is it uh, the mother who decides to buy it or is it the kid? I think that should be an easy answer, right? It is the mother. Mother is the decision maker, right? Mother is the decision maker who pays money. Uh, but uh, you never know, right? I mean, the product what uh, a mother buys, the baby might like or the baby might not like, right? Uh, and it will be, I mean, of course, a mother can recognize everything about the child. But sometimes it might become very difficult uh, for, uh, imagine yourself that you're a, you a baby food manufacturing company. How you should decide on the taste of the baby food? Because here, your consumer or uh, your end user, the person who's going to consume the product is unable to articulate his or her views. And there's a technique available for that, by the way. When we end up in these situations where the, where the end user is unable to tell what he or she likes, what he or she dislikes, right? So, so this is a classic example where the decision maker is the customer. The mother is the customer because she is going to buy, but the consumer or the end user is the baby for whom the food has been bought. And as a food manufacturing company, as a baby food manufacturing company, I will never come to know, should I make it more sweet? Should I add a cherry in it? Should I add dry fruits in it? Probably no, because the kid will not will not be having teeth, so the kid will not be able to chew the dry fruits. Then should I enter the crush of dry fruits? I might powder the dry fruit and uh, put it there, or should I add a, uh, maybe more sweetener into it? I mean, these are some of the decisions which, uh, as a product um, uh, organization, I like to make. Remember, it's a product at the end of the day. Baby food is nothing but a product of what we have. So, uh, so as a product um, owner, I mean, uh, here we have a classic case where as a product owner, I'm not closer to the custom uh, end user, right? I'm not at all closer to the end user. I'm closer to the customer, but I'm not closer to the end user. Remember a dilemma. Imagine you running an agile engagement where you have to create a product backlog of a baby food. How will you do it? Because where will you get the real requirements from? Right. And that becomes a very tricky situation. So who's a user? Uh, the definition, the standard definition of a user is the consumer of a good or a service like the baby food. Right. Often someone who has some innate know how that is unique to consumers. OK, so in literal sense, this is used to distinguish between the person who purchases. I might be buying the product, but my mother might be the consumer like I buy medicines. Right. I will buy the medicine from the medicine shop because my mother or father cannot go to the medicine shop. But ultimately, they are going to be the end users, right? I mean, it's very difficult again to, I mean, if I tell um, the doctor that uh, this is a feedback I'm getting from my parents, the doctor will say they don't know. I mean, they have to eat this medicine because it is bitter, I agree. But if they, they if they eat the bitter medicine, tomorrow they will not have a sugar problem. Otherwise, they will have a sugar problem. I mean, that is how the doctor is going to convey this message, right? Anyways, someone and uh, I mean, if you look at the definition, right, uh, the definition is very interesting. Uh, someone who uses the good or services we produce from individuals who are involved in the stages of its design, development and production. Unfortunately, this definition fails for a baby food product development. I mean, this is a standard definition of a user, someone who is involved in designing, someone who is involved in letting us know what he or she likes or dislikes, someone who is involved in development and production of that product. But unfortunately, this definition fails in a product like a baby food. It miserably is failing there, right? Uh, as the, with the example I gave, customer. Customer is basically someone who purchases the product, 
Um, okay, so if I go and buy the baby food, I'm the customer. If my wife goes and buys the baby food for my kid, then she becomes the customer in that case, right? And uh, and it is uh, if if your customers and users are same, then it becomes a little easier. But invariably, it is not the case. Invariably, you have one segment as a user, you have one segment as a customer. Although they do intersect with each other, it is not uh, something like this. Okay, uh, let me uh, clear one thing uh, because many times people have this confusion that this is user and this is uh, customer. No, they are not two separate islands on this planet Earth. Okay, it's not that a user is not talking at all to the customer. Okay, this is a wrong diagram, what I have drawn. In reality, the customer and the user will interact with each other. So they are basically going to interact on, and it will be two circles which are uh, intersecting with each other. So we have a user circle and uh, we have a customer circle which is there. And the sweet spot is what uh, we as um, uh, uh, we as coaches will have to extract, right? Because that sweet spot, uh, the bigger the, the, in fact, if these two circles uh, are exactly coinciding with each other, nothing like it. I mean, uh, you have hit the bingo. But many times this overlap is so thin, it is very very thin. What you see, the overlap between a user on one side and a customer on another side, right? And that's one of the challenges we face when we're trying to design a product as to what this product is all about, right? Is it, should I design it based on the customer needs? Should I design it on the base of the, on the basis of the user needs? So that's, that's the million dollar dilemma or the million dollar question what we have. So this is uh, the difference between a user and a customer, what we have, or the, the key, key, I would say the difference between these two areas. Okay. So then another big question. Okay. Do we understand our users? Do we understand our customers? Let's come back to users now, because uh, ultimately I think one agreement we are getting is we have to be closer to the user, right? We have to design products, which users will like or dislike. So do we understand the user's attitude? Do we understand how much do we know about users? What is the, do we have a deep understanding about their profile? Okay. And um, this uh, is one of the, there are multiple techniques what we use to identify the users. Now, as I said um, in the opening remarks of this talk, uh, this was a different story 10 years back. I could easily segment my users. And one of the best ways of segmenting was age, right? Zero to 20, 20 to 40, 40 to 80, 60, 60 to 80, like that. And I could easily segment my uh, customers. So for example, if it's a famous, um, let's say Vaishali Dosa in a place where I come from, Pune, uh, the person would ask if it is a senior citizen that, um, do you like to have uh, lesser of chili? Should I ask uh, the person to prepare a milder version of this dosa? And maybe someone who's very enthusiastic, the better would ask of that, um, uh, should you want extra spice in that uh, same masala dosa, right? The Vaishali special dosa. Those of you who are from Pune know what is the Vaishali dosa, right? Or the biryani in Hyderabad, right? I mean, uh, that is how we used to do the uh, segmentation. That is how we used to do the profiling of our customers. But uh, today you won't believe that today we are in a world where there is hyper personalization, which is required. Hyper personalization. I don't know how many of you have seen this. Uh, at least I saw this kiosk in Bangalore Airport. Um, so in Bangalore Airport, shopper stop. Um, when I was last, when I last visited, about a month back or I think two months back, uh, there's a kiosk. And what you can do is um, the kiosk will take your photo. It will actually show you dresses, and you can see how you look in those dresses. Okay. Now you might think that um, I am 50 years old. Another 50 year old person comes, um, uh, the kiosk will recommend the same dresses. You'll be surprised to know the answer is no. In fact, um, I tried this with my friend and uh, our habits are more or less same. Okay. Like um, uh, we don't smoke. Both of us don't smoke. Okay. Uh, both of us um, uh, love to watch uh, comedy movies and all. Okay. I mean, comedy serials, comedy movies, but the profiling came very, very different. Okay. It suggested a totally different attire for me. It suggested a totally different attire for my friends. So what I'm trying to tell is we are in the world of hyper personalization and there are sites which help you do that. They help you integrate your platform, your shopping platform with this one such site is reactive reality. Okay. So if you go on this site, uh, I just quickly take you to the uh, site to just show you what exactly this site is all about. It is a virtual dress fitting site, which is there. Okay. So it is, it is that kind of a personalization you have See. I mean, see what kind of a, a personalization these sites are giving you, right? I mean, based on your personality types, based again, with due respect, okay, it's not to hurt anyone, uh, based on your uh, height, based on your weight, it actually suggests you, okay, it is actually going to suggest you that how exactly which dress will work on you, which dress will not work on you. So what I'm trying to tell here is 
that we are in a zone of hyper personalization it is very difficult to understand your user profiling it is very difficult to understand what is the right segment for your users because the segments are now intersecting with each other for example you might have a 40 plus person who's more interested in trendier clothes whereas a junior person who has um, who's more inclined in a formal dress code because he feels that okay i never got an opportunity opportunity to uh, wear a formal dress in my entire life but i've been always wearing jeans and t-shirt you never know i mean that's how the personas have uh, basically crisp or crossed with each other right and it's very difficult to understand what our users need or what our users want so one of the challenges which we as product owners product managers face is understand what users want right and it's a it's a million dollar question it's very difficult to understand uh, what are their needs what are their likes what are their dislikes okay so so that's a, that's the world we are in in the world of hyper person personalization which is there okay so i don't know how many of you have seen this um, i mean there are many uh, banking sites uh, where they have this um, uh, chatbot which is there right so you don't have to visit a branch now the chatbot will ask you certain questions it will actually fill the form on the uh, on your behalf and it will suggest a product it will suggest that this product will work best for you considering your profile so it's it has got an ai built in even this site the shopper stop kiosk which tells you how you look so for example i just stand in front of that kiosk and then i select uh, maybe a formal coat a formal blazer a formal white shirt and it is going to tell me how i am looking okay so that's the world we are into the world of ai okay so moving ahead okay so the first step what we need to do is we have to understand our users very carefully and we need to empathize with them okay do not criticize them do not ridicule them okay so if someone asks someone asks in a restaurant that you know what um, uh, i mean this is a problem i faced and i was ridiculed i mean i, I mean this is a term which is local um, in pune cutting chai i asked that in a restaurant in bangalore and they were wondering what what exactly i'm looking for what exactly i'm asking this what is this cutting chai all about right but yeah coming back to empathize so basically understand what are the emotions of the users why are the users reacting in a particular way what are their current pain points what are their likes what are their dislikes and try to identify their insights and needs okay now remember there are many things which are hidden also Okay, so there are many things which the consumer, which the users are not going to talk about. They are going to remain very, very silent. They are going to remain very, very, I would say, shy and introvert. They may not reveal many of the things. Of course, we have techniques of uh, empathizing or identifying what are the user needs with these techniques like observation and conversation, user interviews, empathy map persona creation so these are some of the tools which are there uh, by any chance has any of you used these tools uh, especially if you have been performing the role of a product owner or a product manager have you used these tools by any chance uh, you can let me know yes or no okay i see some of you have used it okay some of you have used it, right? Some of you have not used it, which is okay. I mean, I will just be sure working across these tools. What exactly are these tools? Uh, what, what are the benefits of these tools? But the whole intention of using these tools is to understand your user, whether it is empathy map, whether it is um, uh, persona creation, whether it is user interviews, whether it is observation and conversation. Um, it is all about creating and understanding your users in a better way. Okay, so I'm getting some responses on LinkedIn, which I'm also parallelly seeing. Okay, so I think, uh, yeah, Lenscart app. I think one, one person has given an example of a Lenscart app. Yeah, that is also a very good example. Yes, Lenscart also has got, I mean, you can try these frames. You want, you can go ahead and you can uh, try these frames, uh, which are there, right? And whichever suits you. That's another interesting um, uh, thing, which is there. Okay, now what is observation and conversation? Now, this is one of the very interesting tools and techniques which we have used. And I'll give an example where I have used it. Okay, so what is observation and conversation? Anyone would like to um, uh, try it out? What, what exactly is this tool of understanding users? Observation and conversation. Uh, one example I have already given. What was the example I have given? The baby food. So if I want to design a baby food, 
if i would like if i would like to design a baby food what i will do is i'll observe the child very carefully how is he or she reacting to my baby food uh, is he crying is he or she crying is he or she smiling happy a laughing face right because that is what i'll try to observe and then uh, whatever ways i can converse i will try to converse obviously i can't speak in a language what i'm speaking to you right now it has to be more with pictures it has to be more with emotions it has to be more with body language gestures face right and then i will try to extract what exactly is the kid thinking what exactly is the child whether he or she is liking the product whether he or she is not liking the product right now we had used this technique interestingly in one area uh, and i'll tell you where exactly we had used it in one of the engagements the definition says a direct way of viewing individuals in their environment and how they will perform their jobs or tasks and carry out processes that is a very simple straightforward definition what we have it is particularly useful for detailed processes when people who use the product have difficulty or are reluctant to articulate their requirement a difficulty be understood all right a baby baby cannot speak whether he or she likes the product another example can be uh, you are developing a laptop and you want to have an accessibility option in it for example you want to make sure that even people with uh, limited abilities uh, whether it's a deaf and a dumb person or let us say a blind person or let us say a person who unfortunately is amputated in one hand and has got only one hand to use uh, particularly those people they can also use it but they won't be able to articulate their requirement right and you won't be able to empathize with them right because how will you know the uh, the problems faced by them right i mean either i have to um, um, become a gandhari which is a character in mahabharat and uh, see by the way people have done that also when they empathize they have used these techniques also right i mean uh, so what we did in one of the organization was we actually hired uh, blind people as testers for the product and we told them okay show us um, what uh, what are you liking what are you disliking are you getting benefited out of it right so so this is what um, uh, we call it as the um, observation and conversation so they have difficulty they are unable to convey the requirements but the second part they are reluctant to articulate their requirement any idea where will this come they are reluctant to articulate their requirement so you go into an engagement you start this user requirement conversation and you find that users are not um, ready to share the requirements they are reluctant when do you think that happens any thoughts anyone any thoughts on this where it could happen or where could this problem be that uh, users are unable to articulate their requirement either when it is embarrassing perfect yes it could be a product which is an embarrassing product yes perfect that could be the one that's right absolutely right and i believe that yes this audience is a mature enough to understand what we are talking about uh, but more than that more than that um, uh, i mean this is an example i am giving from my career uh, without naming the organization this was um, and uh, somewhat uh, unfortunately it still exists today the biases so we were developing um, a software for one of the leading government organizations in india okay and this was a uh, this was an organization where there was lot of paperwork which was happening so lot of heaps and bounds of files used to move from one desk to another desk lot of papers used to move from one desk to another desk and as a result you know right i mean moment you rely on a physical system the papers get spoiled the papers get damaged the records get um, if there's a fire the, the papers are destroyed right so they are of no use and we were automating a system for them and uh, when we started interacting with these users you know what um, what happened um, these people were reluctant to give information why because they thought you know what their power will be diminished they thought that their job will be at a risk moment we automate something the jobs will be at a risk is what they started have, have a feeling okay and as a result they did not give their requirements okay they said that no no it's a it's not it's a very complicated process you won't understand only we know because and so they are trying to make it as if that it's a person dependent system so how did we uh, do this exercise what we did was whoever used to interact with those people as customers we used to catch them outside the office not within the office because within the office they would have known that we are trying to extract okay so we used to catch them and we used to ask them okay tell us how, what happened when you started interacting with this person uh, what did this person say so the person used to say this person asked us to fill the blue color form okay what is that blue color form what all you wrote okay um, so we used to ask him right i mean i am talking about a era of uh, 20 years back okay 
where we could not take photographs and all right i mean there were no smartphones that time right uh, okay so what did you write in that information what is the difference between let us say i mean why did why are they asking for your permanent address and your current address okay why are they asking for those things okay we used to ask those questions right uh, I, did you attach anything with that form so they used to say yes i attached my mark sheet uh the board mark sheet of 10th standard 12th standard my degree certificate my address proof i attached as a photocopy and that is and then it had to be attested and then we realized okay this is how the process works so that is also another area where we do observation and conversation we may not get to the real um, i mean we may not get to the person who has the requirement but we definitely have to tap the real um, i would say customers here i mean this is a customer we were we are not able to extract the requirement from the end user here we were able to again extract it from the person who was interacting with the end user right and then we designed the system and uh, then we showcased it to them so this is this is many times we have to do this observation and conversation you have to observe how people are working and then you have to converse with them you have to converse with other stakeholders also and then you have to identify okay this probably would be the requirement or this is what will be an apt requirement from a point of view of this product okay so uh, so uh, yes either it is embarrassing for, for, for the people to tell the requirements or basically what happens is um, uh, people do not want to share the requirements because they inherently have a fear that you know what if we share this requirement or if we share the current as is process our jobs will be at a risk okay we will be at a major risk and that is what um, we call it as the uh, the uh, the, uh, the observation and conversation uh, techniques uh, which are there okay so so th these are the observation and uh, conversation uh, techniques uh, what we have as a part of this, this um, exercise okay so yeah this is one of the techniques there are many other techniques okay there are many other techniques uh, which are there right um, and i'm just i'm just going to cover four so i'm just going to cover three more uh, yeah i just wanted to make sure that these are not the only techniques of empathizing with end users i have tried to pick out some of the important ones but there are more than um, i would say at least 10 15 more techniques uh, which could be there okay for empathizing with the user and trying to understand what they do the second one is user interviews it can be a one to one interview it can be a one to many interview we call them in a group and you try to understand their current needs and unmet needs right what are the problems they are facing what are their current needs is the current system okay what are the lacuna in the current system and remember needs can be implicit needs can be explicit for example um, i mean this is one of the biggest lessons we learned um, we asked the user okay we asked the user that um, you know what okay once a booking is cancelled what do you want so they said um, yeah yeah i mean um, just an sms and an email Mail would be suffice. Okay, SMS and email should be suffice. So if a, a ticket is cancelled uh, with the refund amount, um, the message should go on an SMS and the message should go on an email. And they said okay, but when we went in for a review, sprint review, they said what about WhatsApp? If this number is linked to WhatsApp, um, it should be there. We said you never told us. They said no, we thought that it is an implicit need. If you can do it for SMS, you can do it for WhatsApp. Again, uh, it was badly art articulated. Um, I would say gray area. but uh, many times uh, they think that it's an implicit need we think that it has to be explicitly told to us right that confusion always happens or that disconnect always happens so make sure you understand make sure you understand what are the implicit needs what are the explicit needs like no one is going to tell you that the password has to be encrypted right that is a known thing you cannot say that it was never in the document or it was never in the user story those are your explicit um, uh, they won't tell you explicitly they are uh, they are implicit needs right that when i'm typing a password uh, it should not be visible so that on looker should not be able to see it right but having that hint uh, having that toggle which actually reveals the password is an explicit need nowadays you have right i mean uh, um, it will actually show you what password you have entered and you only use that toggle when no one is behind you or you are sitting um, uh, in front of a wall like me right now right so that is uh, that is what is a uh, explicit need right but implicit need has to be that it has to be properly authenticated it has to be asterisk or it has to be masked those are definitely going to be the implicit needs which are there all right so we have user interviews as the second technique and uh, many sometimes your clients may not agree to record the interviews okay remember this uh, not always they are going to agree for a recording because they might say something which um, they would not like to say right and accidentally it comes in the flow right uh, so also the technique of an interviewer is to extract the information okay from people okay so there are different probing techniques asking probing questions 
um, beating around a bush and then hitting the bullseye, right? Uh, those are the techniques which will help you to extract the answers from the end user, right? So we have explicit need and we have implicit needs based on which um, you can capture the requirements. Okay, so that's the second technique which is there. The first one was uh, related to what we call as observation and conversation. Second one is user interviews. The third one what we have is empathy map. Uh, empathy map is a very interesting tool. Okay, and, and by the way, these four tools are not in any particular order. Okay, you can use them in any order. So empathy map is like a photograph of your user. Okay, so if you take my photograph right now, it will show that, okay, my um, hairs have gone from here. It is white hair, right? Uh, uh, salt paper in some part, right? Uh, this is my spectacle nose, right? I'm, I'm wearing a kind of a jacket, right? Um, and then white shirt. So it will show, and then there's a mic here, right? It will show that as a profile. So my profile will come out. Similarly, empathy map is a profile which comes out, okay? It, it gives you a 360 degree view about the end user. A photograph still is not giving you a 360 degree view, right? It is not um, telling you how is my posture from the backside, right? Whether my vertebra is proper or not, right? Uh, or an X-ray, you can make it as an X-ray. Actually, X-ray is a better word for this, um, um, I would say for a empathy map, right? It reveals a 360 degree view about your customers. What do they think and feel okay so the first thing what it reveals is what is the user thinking right uh, thinking could be that you know what uh, today i wasted you know what three hours and this product is not at all helpful right uh, i wonder if there were, would have been an easier way right easier way of doing this right i mean why they have unnecessary Really complicated this. I hope the processing does not take long. Last time when the salary processing was being done for one lakh plus, plus employees, I had to spend almost two days in office. So that is what uh, he or she is thinking about the product. The current as a state with an apprehension because probably there are some problems and sometimes those problems are resurfacing are surfacing again and again. So probably January salary went on smooth. February was a problem. March, April was smooth. Again, May had some issues and June, uh, you spent nearly three days in office. So that is what you're thinking. Now, what happens to the July salary processing? Okay, so that is one thing. What are your feelings? Okay, is the user confused? Is the user happy with the product? Is the user blaming someone? You know what, so-and-so company, they wasted our money. They did not do a good product development. Or you know what, um, I should have paid more attention to when this uh, user manual was training was being given sometimes users do that okay if you an analyze the profile of the users they will try to blame themselves they'll try to, to put the blame on someone else so that is what uh, comes in as a part of the feelings which are there right the users and emotional state is what we call as the feelings of what we have there okay so those are the feelings actions and quotes so what do i take actions it could be a workaround also so last month on the salary processing took a lot of time. Let me take a workaround. Okay, let me do it in a different way this time. Or let me go through a, a different style of uh, doing the processing. So that comes under the workaround, which is there. Okay, so that's a, a workaround, what we call, right? And some quotes. We always have those quotes, right? Um, I mean, uh, uh, and I'm sure these quotes are in our vernacular language, right? Uh, especially when we are having this uh, tea time discussion, water polar movements. We uh, invariably these quotes come out, right? I mean, oh no, this again, again it has cracked. Oh no, I think today night again I have to spend in office, right? Because just now I got an error, I've taken a bio break, but I can clearly see that I won't have time for dinner also today. So those are the quotes which come out, right? So thoughts, feelings, actions, and quotes. Okay, so those are the four main quadrants. And there are um, also some more things like um, uh, sites, right? What exactly do we see? What is the first thing which comes to my eyes when I look at the system? Right? Is it that uh, uh, deadly error message which comes out 404 error when I open the site or is it any other error number which is equally dangerous as 404 and that is what um, comes out from the empathy map. Right? So when you do a uh, discussion, when you do an interview, when you do an interview with the end users, you also try to create an empathy map of the user Okay, and you try to picture what exactly is the user's current state of mind vis-a-vis -vis the usage of this product, right? And what influences the users, right? Uh, I mean, see, many times there are biases also, right? Uh, five people complaining about a product, you automatically start complaining. Six people um, uh, saying that it's a good product, you also automatically start saying that, yeah, it's not really a bad product, it is a good product, right? So that will be the influences, right? Uh, what they have heard from third parties, okay, what they have heard from uh, basically uh, other people about it, end users, customers. So that comes in as a part of your you know, biases, which are there. So that, that is nothing but influences uh, what we have. So those are nothing but the critical influences. And if you look at it, 
if you look at it at the bottom two there are two boxes there pains and gains what are the current pains just listing down in summary four to five uh, pointers or bullet points what are the current pains uh, what gains are you expecting so when you are when you are going to re engineer the product or when the uh, product is going to be redesigned what are the critical gains we can expect from this particular product so that will be coming in as a part of gains so pains on one side and gains on another side right so this is a, uh, this is of course the photo has been credited to paul book in his book where he has talked about a empathy map uh, by the way all these tools are available in mural or uh, miro okay so you can use those tools um, uh, to get a template of uh, all these uh, tools which i'm talking about right i mean there are techniques for observation conversation also which you can capture uh, you can also capture the interview results um, in a format and the overall empathy map is what we have yeah so this is the third tool what we have uh, which will help us understand the users in a better way uh, the fourth tool i'm sure each one of you would be aware of it each one of you would have heard it and many of you would have also used it it is nothing but user persona what is a user persona can anyone tell me i'm sure people know this already what is a user persona any any idea what is a user persona all about because you see my suddenly my photograph there because that was the safest photograph to use uh, to be very honest uh, obviously i had to take permission if i had to use anyone else's uh, photograph so what exactly is a user persona a user persona is um, a, a profile of a likelihood consumer or a customer of your product okay and lot of detailing has to go when you are making a user persona you cannot just create a persona like that right i mean lot of profiling lot of um, uh, understanding has to go and the picture is also equally important for example this cannot be a user persona if i were to put this user persona for an account with let us say a nationalized bank this cannot be a persona this is a wrong example probably instead of me my mother's photograph should come there because she is a pensioner and her um, account is state bank of india so photograph is very important okay this cannot be a persona for a, a product which say for example is for the youth okay this definitely cannot be that persona right so you have to be very careful what exactly is this persona for many of us make that blunder many of us make that mistake that um, uh, this um, uh, this actually uh, i mean anything can do do for persona no anything cannot go for persona right i mean it has to be done in a proper way it has to be done in a, a proper formatting is what uh, you will have to do for persona and you have to spend lot of time and money and investment on identifying what exactly is the user profiling we have seen lot of products going becoming failure because the right persona was not employed okay so the right set of persona or the right set of elements while creating the user persona uh, were not applied right and uh, it's a major disaster okay that uh, turns out into a major product disaster uh, when that happens so what is a user persona a user persona is a, a process of humanizing your target users what do they like what do they dislike uh, right um, what is their personality like uh, right uh, what are their um, uh, what are their uh, interests what are their dislikes etc right and two examples of persona which we all know now in this world um, of um, google uh, in this world of amazon in this world of apple anyone can uh, tell me any two, two personas which you interact with daily almost we have started interacting with the two personas daily one or the other not both at the same time okay um uh, one or the other it's nothing but uh, the two two ladies in your life right who are the two ladies in our life siri and um, alexa right i mean these are nothing but personas siri and alexa are nothing but user personas i mean they created personas out of which these products have come out right um, so yeah i mean these are the uh, two ladies uh, in the life uh, i mean not uh, that everyone has both of them but definitely we have one of them right either it's alexa or it is siri right i mean it has become a kind of a conversation we have with them right uh, siri and alexa right uh, alexa sorry yeah so so this is this is what uh, we call it as the persona and this is what we call it as a user persona what is there and as i said it is very important to identify the user persona um by the way i i, I haven't worked in a baby fruit product company but i don't know if they have a persona of a kid uh, that is how i started my session with right uh, it it makes a good sense to have a persona of a mother uh, who's the consumer who's going to buy the product and also at the same time to have a persona of a kid right of a child right of a toddler and a photograph of that kid there right it it definitely makes a sense right i i personally feel that you do require a user persona from that side also all right yeah so these were the tools uh, which i wanted to cover 
uh, these were uh, some of the very uh, pertinent tools as i said this is the bubble up of the first part uh, in the weeks to come i will also have sessions on the other part 2 3 4 5 6 as i said last time uh, but i can't commit whether it will be next week uh, but definitely we'll cover what are defined what is the defined process in design thinking what is an ideate process what is a prototype what is a test what is an implement process we definitely will be covering this um, as we move along the journey and uh, yeah as i committed it will be a full design thinking uh, series which will be covered with you by the way whatever i have covered today again can be blown into a half a day session okay so when we go for a design thinking workshop it's usually a 3 to 4 day workshop okay and each one of them uh, what i have covered in um, 45 to 50 minutes today or not even 45 minutes i don't know what is the time i have lost a sense of it but whatever it is yeah so whatever time i have spent right 40 minutes uh, that actually gets bubbled up into i would say uh at least a 3 to 4 hour session where we actually use these techniques we actually use these techniques for a product designing and try to find out what are the pain points of the customer okay in a real design thinking workshop um, each of this get bubbled up into at least a 3 to 4 hour session with a practical hands on experience yeah so on that note um, i take a pause here and um, i would like to open up the floor for any questions if anyone has uh those of you who are here can ask me the questions directly uh those of you who are on linkedin live uh, please feel free to type in your questions in the chat and i will come back to you offline uh, once uh, the session is over i will answer your questions but yeah with this uh, i would uh, like to open the floor for questions and uh, yeah i am uh, now allowing you to unmute yourself uh, so yeah anyone wants to ask a question you can now use the mic uh, on zoom and you can ask me the question anyone with a question okay uh i hope uh, this session was uh, beneficial to all of you um, i sincerely hope that this was something which was beneficial to all of you and you learned uh, something out of it uh yeah i think there are questions on linkedin couple of questions on linkedin but yeah as i said um, yeah let me see if i can quickly retrieve them no i think this okay i'll in any case i'll revert back to you on linkedin live later especially folks on linkedin live and yeah just a request to all of you do subscribe to my channel uh, the youtube channel um, which is there and yeah it is called agile coaching and transformation leadership and uh, yeah if you subscribe uh, you will see 100 plus videos there which will help you to you know, i mean grow learn more as you go along the journey yeah any any questions here one last opportunity anyone any questions uh and you feel free to come on camera if you are okay all right um, i mean i'll be more than happy to see you uh, people also uh if you are fine you can come on a camera also if that i mean if that's okay again it's not a mandatory but it's um, i mean if you feel okay do do come on a camera yeah anyone any questions meanwhile uh, feel free to ask here okay seems there are no questions uh, today so i don't know um i hope this session was helpful to you uh, this session was uh, useful to all of you so so thanks thanks uh, yeah i think let me see there is a ch chat here okay thanks thanks kamal thanks kamal for the, the feedback uh, really appreciate yeah uh, i always believe that uh, there is nothing called as a free session okay this was also not a free session uh, you might be wondering what i am saying because you have invested the most precious investment of uh, with you you have invested 45 minutes with me okay that's a most precious investment so nothing is free in this world okay so even right now you have spent a considerable you have done a lot of investment in me so thanks uh, very much uh, to all of you and on that note um, i leave you uh, next week we have an external speaker okay next week i'm taking a break i think people would get bored hearing me out so next week i'm taking a break but we have a very interesting speaker uh, do uh, do subscribe uh, and when if you are in my connections you will come to know it is uh, vivek ganeshan who will be coming and talking about uh, technical agility practices so i'm taking a break of a week and uh, we will be having an, a new speaker next week with another interesting topic so thanks thanks everyone and have a happy friday and a happy weekend to all of you thanks for um, uh, attending my session bye for now thank you